Welcome to our YouTube live and uh, hopefully we have gone live <laughs> okay. and uh, so this is just my chance to recap on what the FOMC said what the Federal Reserve said about its monetary policy and let me just start off with the broad comments from the Fed so many people expected that we would get a 25 basis point that's a 0.25 percent increase in the policy rate and that's exactly what we got so now we're sitting at between five and a quarter percent and five and a half percent for their policy rate that means that overall now since March of 2022 they've raised interest rates by a very aggressive 5.25 percentage points or 525 basis points and that's pretty fast and markets clearly didn't like it initially but now we've gone back to a euphoric rally with the Nasdaq. The market reaction it's probably worth pointing out hasn't been very large. There was a rally during the time when Powell was speaking for the for the Nasdaq and for the S&P and then just as he finished speaking it fell back down pretty much to where it was. Also in the rate space there wasn't a massive move either so this was pretty much signalled what we'd get and we got what we expected. In terms of the kind of uh, change in the language well actually we can talk about that in a second as we go through the slides um, but let me just kind of recap um, previous expectations for previous meetings and that's kind of interesting if we do that for the um, for the kind of probabilities of what could happen. So let me just share this with you. And now you probably notice I've got a ficus in the background rather than the palm, uh, which is what I had earlier because the, the palm tree was getting a little bit disheveled. And uh, so we have been to the shops. Laura and I were also arguing about whether it's a ficus or a ficus, which I've never heard. Um, yeah, ficus. That can't be true. Okay. <laughs> Everyone in my family called it a ficus. I don't know if that's right or not. So let's let's just share screen. I can remember how to do it. And OBS. Yes. Right. So here I am with my expectations. Good. And um, so you can see that the, the, the kind of meeting probabilities, what I'll show you here is what the meeting probabilities have been in terms of where the rate's going to move to as we go through time and how those expectations have changed radically over the previous meetings. So this was in February the 1st, on February the 1st of this year, just before the meeting actually happened. And for every single meeting, whatever the market was signaling was most likely, in this case, an increase to between 4.5 and 4.75%. That's almost exactly what happened. In fact, that is exactly what happened. So. But what's interesting is what the expectations are about the future. So at that point, people were expecting the cycle to end at 475 to 500 basis points and then stay there until September of 2023 and then get modest cuts back to 450. But then what we see is people got much more. Uh, they expected the cycle to go higher but then not stay there for as long and then the cuts would start in July 2023 and then be quite aggressive. You can see lots of these 0.25% rate cuts. Then in May what we got was even higher so the cycle would go up to 500 basis points and then we just get lots of aggressive cuts for each successive meeting and the first one would be in September of 2023 now we've got to the point where, well, the previous meeting, we got to the point where we probably stay there for three meetings. So we get three meet, two meetings where there was no change in the policy. Then the cuts would start in December of this year. This morning, what we saw was an expectation that the first cut wouldn't happen until March of next year. So I think that's much more realistic. It's certainly much more in line with what the Federal Reserve's been saying. They expect that probably inflation is going to be closer to their 2% target at the end of 2025. So policy cuts are very unlikely um, towards the end, certainly in the middle of this year and probably not until next. So I think this is a more realistic set of probabilities now and the market's pretty much aligned with what the Fed's saying, which is good to see.
because that's when you don't get shocks and that's what disrupts markets. If we actually look at the changes in the uh, statement, which is published just before the FOMC press conference starts, and there's a nice thing from Nick Timraus, who's the Wall Street Journal correspondent. This shows the changes word by word from the previous statement. And this time the changes are absolutely tiny. The only change which is substantive is that the economic activity has been expanding at a moderate pace rather than a modest pace. So clearly growth has been better than expected. And the rest of the language is just about the change in the actual percentage rate. Otherwise, it's very similar to the previous meeting, which, remember, was where they held the rates constant for the first time in a long time. And it was described as a hawkish pause or a hawkish skip, if that were possible. Hawkish means that they try to raise rates. Dovish means that they tend to uh, keep rates lower. But it was described as a hawkish skip. But there, are, there was more questions. There were more questions about the rate at which the Fed would be hiking. Now, many people, of course, now expect that we're pretty close to the end of the cycle, and that's certainly what Powell was saying during the course of the press conference. So, the first thing I should point out is this: his tie was purple. Now, some people, some journalists, read a lot into this, and in fact, he got a compliment on his purple tie. So I'm not sure what the significance of that is. He was a bit nonplussed, clearly, <laughs> when the journalist said it. But there we go, purple. So let's go to the summary of economic projections. Now, this is from the previous Fed meeting. They didn't update it this time. They don't at every meeting. But just to remind you of what the Fed expects. So the most important thing, I guess, is the federal funds rate projection and how it's expected to change over time. So the median is like the central case for all of the forecast of all the um, economic projections for every economic for every member of the FOMC. So you get these dot plots with one dot per member saying where they expect the policy rate to be in 2023, 24, 25 and over the longer run. And this median is just the median point on that dot plot. So you can see that uh, the Fed members expected on average, median, two more rate hikes from where we were then, up to 5.6%. Well, we've already got one of those, and we may get another, maybe at the next meeting, maybe at another. It's always data dependent, but it really, uh, if, if the data's unfolding as they expected, which Powell said it was, then this is what we'd expect for policy. And really, we're not down below 4.6 until we get to 2025. So even at the end of 2024, we're only one percentage point below where we'll be at the end of 2023. So rate cuts in 2024 is what the Fed's expecting, but not a lot of them. This is four rate cuts and, and then more in 2025, assuming that inflation follows the Fed's forecast, which is 3.2% at the end of this year, 2.5% uh, at the end of next, and 21 uh, in 2025 so and and not a huge pickup in inflation un in unemployment and you know that's going to increase to 4.5 percent and uh, GDP was not expected to be negative so no recession soft landing so these are the dot plots and you can see um, you can see that the falls really start in 2024 rather than 2023 now, the labour market is the key thing that the Fed is, is monitoring because if it's a tight labour market, that tends to push up inflation and particularly for services, which is very wage dependent, that is uh, going to be kept high for longer if there's a tight labour market, probably. So how tight is the labour market now? Well, one of, fa one of Jerome Powell's favourite measures is the number of job vacancies per unemployed person. Now, this is elevated in the UK as well as the US. If you watch our coverage of, of the UK uh, monetary policy meetings, then you'll see that the UK is in a similar situation. In America, it's even tighter. In the UK, we've got about one job per unemployed person. In the US, they've still got 1.6. So it is moving in the right direction, but it's still hugely elevated compared, compared to where it was before the pandemic, where even at the highest point, it was just around 1.1, 1.2. 
Now we're at 1.6. It is falling, but still very, very, very tight. And that's inflationary. And if we compare that with inflation on the bottom panel, the headline inflation rate, that is falling very, very, very rapidly now. But what we'll look at in a moment is core, which isn't falling so much. And that's the measure which the Fed focuses on. And what I was highlighting here is if you overlay recessions, you can see that it's mostly recessions which restore the imbalance between labour supply and labour demand. So the tightness of the labour market is fixed, if you like to call it that, by um, a recession, which is a pickup in unemployment after all. So, so far it's been a soft landing. We haven't had a rapid fall in the tightness of the labour market. And I think it would take more of a recession or certainly a more weakness, economic weakness, in order to get this tightness out of the labour market. But maybe we'll be able to adjust without that. Let's hope that's the case. If we look at employment data in the United States, this is what people look at. It's the non-farm payrolls. And this is the number of jobs which the US economy has created month by month. This is the total number of non-farm jobs, which is at around 150 million, just over 150 million now. And what people typically look at is the monthly change of that. And it has started to slow down. It's hard to see it in this data. But if we go and zoom in, you can see the monthly numbers here, the monthly changes. Just to absorb new entrants into the US economy as people leave school, um, you'd expect 100,000 just to keep jobs ticking over or employment ticking over. We're still above that, but you can see that it's slowed down after the huge spike following the unemployment spike with the pandemic. So it is slowing down, which is in line with the Fed's narrative of slowing demand and job supply and demand getting back into balance. So that's good news from the Fed's point of view. And what's not so good is the potential for a price wage spiral. Now, there was a lot of commentary about this during the press conference, but if we look at earnings growth in the United States, it currently is running at 4.4%. Now, that's very high compared to where we were in normal times. There it was at around 25 to 3%. Usually that's where it would be. I remember at the time, you know, 3.1% shocked markets and sent stocks tumbling a little bit at the time before the pandemic. But, you know, we're now at 4.4 and it is slowing down a bit, it seems, but not slowing down a lot. And it's still not consistent with 2% inflation. So the Fed wants to see wage growth fall. But what's good about the United States and not the UK is that CPI inflation has fallen below earnings growth. In other words, people's wages are growing faster than inflation for good reasons, right? Which is that earnings growth is still reasonable and CPI has fallen a lot. Headline CPI has fallen a lot in the US. In the UK, in inflation is still high and nominal wage growth is high. So we've still got the problem with accelerating core inflation or still high core inflation and um, negative real earnings. I think it's just on the cusp of being positive in the UK. But now let's look at the balance sheet for the Fed, because this is the other part of its monetary policy. It's bought about $9 trillion worth of assets during quantitative easing and you know, successive cycles of quantitative easing after the global financial crisis. And then after the pandemic, we got another huge explosion in size of the Fed's balance sheet as it bought up all those US treasuries in order to get the longer end of the yield curve to fall and make uh, borrowing cheaper for US companies and also to stimulate the economy. Well, it's now doing quantitative tightening as the size of the Fed's balance sheet shrinks. And it fell from its peak by about 7%. Then we got the banking crisis in, in the US, we got the regional banking crisis, and the Fed essentially lent out its balance sheet to those banks, let them provide it with treasuries, and that was used to shore up the capital of the banks as in, a, in a form of cheap loan. Well, the Fed was very generous with its balance sheet, but then you can see that the use of that facility has shrunk, and now we've gone back to pretty much the previous pace of tightening of the size of the balance sheet. 
if we look at the size of that, if we, if we zoom out and put it in perspective, all the way going all the way back to 2003, you can see that we've still not tightened a lot. You know, we have, we're, so we've still got a balance sheet which is over $8 trillion. Now, just remember that the Fed isn't selling these treasuries. It's just not, um, when, when they mature, it's just not reinvesting the principal. So gradually, organically, the size of the balance sheet is is uh, is shrinking, uh, but it still hasn't shrunk by much. But it is shrinking at a fair old rate. So I think it's thirty five million dollars a month of mortgage backed securities are allowed to mature, and I think sixty billion a month for U.S. Uh, treasuries. So that's the rate at which the balance sheet is allowed to shrink now. So that's also tightening policy. That's another arm of the monetary policy. It's not just about interest rates. But what's worrying about core inflation is that if we look at CPI core in the US, and it's better than the UK, I've got to say, but you can see that core, which is in yellow, is still pretty elevated compared to headline inflation. Why does the central bank focus on core? Because it's less volatile, because food and energy are excluded, and that means it's more predictive of what happens to headline inflation. If you're using a very volatile measure, to try and predict what happens in future, it can make you steer the ship, oversteer the ship, kind of like oversteering a car. So that's why the, the central banks focus on core, and core is still pretty high. 4.9% is not falling anywhere near as quickly as headline, because energy, of course, has been stripped out, and energy is pushing down inflation a lot. If we, could, if we look at the year-on-year -year numbers, break it down by components, the annual changes are here on the left. The monthly changes are here on the right for various components. You can see that fuel, oil and other fuels, gasoline, airline fares, utility, piped gas service, all of those are clearly in a state of deflation, pretty deep deflation. These other components are still in positive territory, still increasing year on year. But you can see that that disinflationary force of... Um, all those energy prices is what's pulling headline down. Unfortunately, now we're left with services which are very sticky and uh, much more difficult to reduce because those are driven by wages, which, as we saw, are still rising pretty quickly at over 4%, around 4.4%. So this is the measure that the Fed actually looks at. It's not CPI inflation. It's the personal consumption expenditures inflation. And you can see that the core PCE there really hasn't fallen much at all. And this is what the Fed is kind of worried about, because if wage growth continues to be brisk, that's unlikely to fall much. Headline, of course, has fallen, so that's falling pretty rapidly, and that's at 3.8% uh, currently. So this core PCE number, what the Fed is really focused on is for that to start to move down, to see clear signs of disinflation. And once they see that, they can start to ease off on their monetary policy. But certainly for now, their stance, as they call it, is they're pretty close to tight monetary policy, as tight as it needs to be. Maybe a little bit more, maybe 0.25% more is required. And they're going to, just going to wait and see, probably for some time, until they see a material move downwards in this core PCE number and many other measures as well. So this, if we break it down into three different components, the personal consumption expenditures, inflation, durable goods, durable goods and non-durable goods. To first approximation, a good example of this is durable goods would be your car and non-durable durable goods would be the uh, gasoline that you pump into your car. And both of those have fallen due to uh, easing of supply constraints and... Um, People have moved from consumption of goods to consumption of services, which is a normalization of behavior, behavior that we had before the pandemic. But the one which is sticky, you can see, is services, and that's wage driven. So while these two have fallen, largely due to factors which the Fed can't control, the services component, which is driven by demand, of course, um, which the Fed can control, that hasn't really fallen. And that is still a cause for concern for the Fed. If we look at expectations of, of um, inflation, so this is looking at the expectation of five year ahead 
five year inflation. So this is a measure of what markets think inflation will be in five years over the next five years following that. That's a measure of whether markets think the Fed has inflation under control. The dashed red line you can see is the 2% target for the Fed. Now what's worrying is that this has actually spiked recently as we got um, maybe core inflation not really responding to monetary policy. Powell didn't mention this, but in fact, it looks to me like that's moved up quite a bit recently. Um, it's not too far off the, the high with that we've seen over this recent cycle since 2022. So he said that monetary policy was expectations of inflation were very firmly anchored if you do surveys of households, which may be true. But certainly if you look at this market measure, it looks like expectations are actually rising for inflation. So another point that was kind of contentious in the past is whether we're really seeing tighter economic conditions. Now, remember, we had the banking crisis when banks were less likely to lend because of the uh, defaults of Silicon Valley Bank and other regional banks in the United States. Um, now, that should have tightened credit conditions. But if you actually look at one of the Fed's measures of economic conditions, which is the Chicago Fed National Financial Conditions Index, where it, when it goes red, that's tighter credit conditions. It's harder to get a loan, a mortgage. Um, credit is harder to get. And then when it goes down and goes blue, that's easing of conditions. Well, it's pretty clear that economic conditions are easing here. So this is running contrary to the Fed's narrative, which is that credit conditions are very tight. Now, one of the things that Powell mentioned was the SLUS survey, the Senior Loan Officers Survey, which comes out next week. It'll be interesting to see what it says. But he was hinting that it was going to show tight policy from banks. So banks are tightening up on their lending and it's getting even tighter, that monetary policy, that uh, credit conditions from banks. So harder to get a loan from a bank if you're a company, whether you're a small company or a large company in the United States. So that SLUS survey shows that credit conditions are tightening. But certainly based on this measure, which also inclu includes market variables like credit spreads and the corporate bond market, those are very tight still. And if you look at the equity market, that's rallying like crazy for the Nasdaq. So it's pretty clear that that's not consistent with tighter economic policy. And uh, it doesn't seem to be feeding through that mechanism at least. So not clear to me that uh, conditions are tightening. And if, if they're not, then the Fed may require uh, it may require the Fed to become more aggressive later on. But we'll just have to see what happens to that inflation number uh, at later meetings. Now, the next meeting is going to be in September. And Powell said that we're going to have various data points that come out before then. We'll have two CPI numbers and we'll also get um, two um, unemployment reports or employment reports, as they're called before that meeting. And so we'll have lots more data to go on. Remember, the previous meeting to this one was only a month uh, before this one. So so that by that time in September, we'll have plenty more data. There wasn't much data between that previous meeting and this one, but we'll get loads before the next one. So hopefully we'll have a much better view about whether inflation's finally starting to fall. So let me just stop there and I'll switch back to me and let's have a look at your questions. So please do like and share this with other people. And if you're not subscribed to our channel, please do subscribe. It certainly helps us if you do that. And uh, that way you won't miss any new content. And uh, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And usually at this point, I summon my dog Teddy. And this time I have quiet treats for Teddy. So Laura gave me some biltong and biltong is a lot quieter because people were complaining that the uh, treats I had were very noisy and crunchy. So uh, now I've got non-crunchy snacks for Ted. Ted! Teddy! Ted! If I, if I, if I rattle the box. Right, okay. Teddy! Oh, hello. 
He was sniffing a lot earlier. There we go. So if you do have any questions, please do super chat or um, you can always become one of our supporters on YouTube. We'll push your questions to the front of the queue. Teddy, I can't believe it. You're going to eat it off the table. Got no manners. There we go. Yeah, so if you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. And um, usually it takes people a few moments to think about it. Unlike this dog who doesn't have to think about treats. Very good. Oh yes, it's very good. Teddy, you don't even chew. It just goes straight down. You're supposed to save the flavour. There we go. And we've got the big one, the big finish. You ready? The big one. Yes. That's all of it. It's just the lousy treats now, the healthy ones. Sorry, mate. Very good. You can't see his tail wagging, but he's, <laughs> he's wagging his tail. Brilliant. So let's see if we've got any questions. Uh, we've got no super chats. We've got uh, no member questions. But I see we do have some questions, so that's good. And oh, we've got some quick, some comments about ficus. Oh yeah, here we go. So Lynn says ficus, don't overwater. Okay. Oh, now he gets treats from Laura. Yeah. <laughs> uh, big up the main man. Thank you, Mike. That's kind of you. Uh, yes, Lynn says that the other plant was looking poorly. Yeah, that was my problem. But Laura, Laura kind of took the other plant away. She insisted on getting a healthy one. Base effects dropping off. OK, so this is a point about base effects. So we saw the headline numbers were falling. This is a comment from Spherical Hang, who says base effects are dropping off and that could lead to more inflation rises. Certainly it would re lead to uh, the disinflation, the slowing down of inflation going away. And what we'll be left with is that core inflation, probably. Um, yeah, so a lot of the disinflation that we're seeing now is due to that energy for the headline number. But of course, if we strip out the energy and food components, then the, the, the core number isn't really falling much at all. As we saw for personal consumption expenditures core, that's not really falling much at all. In fact, there's been almost no progress there uh, still, um, which is pretty worrying. And LFX says... Um, Without Ubuntu, it isn't the same thing, Roman. Yeah, because I switched to Windows because I've got a camera now, a Canon camera, and it just wasn't compatible with um, with Ubuntu. So, yeah, I finally caved in after 20 years and switched from Ubuntu Linux to uh, to Windows. So the sharp-eyed among you will have noticed that uh, this is brought to you by Microsoft. Uh, yeah. So it's raining, yes. Uh, so more plant advice from James Norton. He says, the best thing is to have bright light. You should keep your ficus, not ficus, in a bright spot where it gets loads, lots of indirect light. Yeah, that's the trouble in this office because I have the, the blinds closed. I can't have natural light when I'm shooting. So I have to open the blinds when it's when I'm not shooting or move the ficus. Uh, when it's well, I'm not shooting. If power tightens too much, will that likely mean QE? Um, well, I mean, he did talk about monetary policy and how you can kind of split it between the balance sheet and rates, and the two can be doing different things. But certainly, both of them are in tightening mode right now. Both the shrinking of the balance sheet, quantitative tightening combined with increasing rates. So both of them are in tightening mode at the moment. They're both pulling in the same direction. But in theory, just like we got during the banking crisis, you can have an easing on the balance sheet, a kind of restart of QE in a way, although they didn't describe it as that, at the same time as they had monetary policy um, with interest rates increasing and tightening. 
So they can pull in opposite directions sometimes. So it is quite a nuanced set of tools which the Fed has. And uh, it's been a while since Jerome Powell talked about his toolbox. Um, but uh, apparently they've got a lot of tools in that toolbox. But rates and the balance sheet are the two primary weapons in their arsenal. Um, uh, price of oil going up to $84. How can inflation be controlled in the circumstances? Yeah, I mean, if we get another energy spike, it's pretty clear that headline would be affected. Core, not so much, I don't think. Not this time around, unless it was a really big spike. I think this Christmas or this, this winter, we may have a problem with energy. I don't think the US will, but I think Europe might, because we'll compete with with China and Europe for liquefied natural gas. And that could push up energy prices again this winter, if it's a cold winter, say. And that pr could be a problem for Europe, but I think much less of a problem for, for the United States. Oh, we've got a we've got a super chat. Yeah, we've got a super chat from David Garth. Thank you, David. And he says the inflation in developed economies will devalue their debt in the longer term, presumably. One trillion tomorrow isn't as much as it is today. Yeah, I think I think the point about about inflating away debt is that it's a very painful process. Usually, if inflation is high, it is so unpopular that most governments which are in power when it happens, such as the Conservative Party in the UK or the Democrats in the United States right now, usually it changes the party in power because it's such a horrible process. And people just get the feeling that when inflation is really high, it's the government's fault. Even though if, you know, if it's something like the pandemic, which clearly was not created by the government even I wouldn't think that you know I don't think that's the case the the kind of spike in in inflation was largely a result of occurrences during the pandemic and thanks to in Ukraine's Russia's invasion of Ukraine so that's an exogenous shock it's not created by the government but people blame the government for not being able to control it so so Certainly governments would not choose to inflate away their own debt because it would be signing their own death sentence. They'll lose power if inflation's high. So as a policy to get rid of your debt, it's a very bad policy for any politician. But does it devalue the nominal value of your debt? Yes, unless, like the UK, you've got a lot of inflation-linked bonds. Those inflation-linked bonds actually increase in line with inflation. So that's a pretty, um, you know, that's why the UK debt has actually, the debt servicing costs have actually spiralled much more than other developed markets because the UK has more inflation-linked bonds. The US has some inflation-linked bonds, but not as many as the UK. And not, not enough to substantively affect the debt servicing cost. But is it a good policy to inflate away your debt? Usually not. Because the amount of inflation you need to do it is is going to cause so much pain. But is it deliberate, this policy, to get rid of debt? I don't think so. I don't think the government has engineered this. I think that it was an exogenous shock. And in fact, they're doing, doing their best to address it. So the point is that also that uh, the, usually you can carry a lot of debt without things going wrong if you're a developed market. So debt to GDP ratios, as long as they're fairly stable and not rising rapidly. In other words, if your GDP growth, GDP growth is greater than the rate of growth of the debt, which in turn is based on its on the on the average rate on that you're paying on that debt. So if GDP growth is greater than that average rate that you're paying on the debt, then that shrinks the size of your debt relative to GDP, assuming you're not issuing lots of new debt. So that was a situation, remember, before the pandemic. After the pandemic, because there had to be lots of spending in order to stimulate the economy, that's what led to the increase in debt to GDP. Um, but that has gone away now. A lot of that spending is now done. And we can start to see growth recover, certainly in the United States. But the problem, I think, in Europe is that the growth hasn't really picked up. So we can't grow out of this out of this huge debt spike so quickly as the United States. 
But I think the US is much more on a sustainable path than, say, the UK. Um, but if you look at the certainly if you look at the um, the US uh, Congressional Budget Office, the CBO, their forecast is that it's not sustainable. So unless there's a cut in spending or an increase in taxes, the US debt is not sustainable. But of course, the US has that choice to increase taxes or or to cut spending, neither of which are very palatable with the electorate. Um, but we'll just have to see whether whether the US does adjust and get its debt dynamics back under control. But they've got much more leeway to do that, I think, than the UK. Because here growth is weaker and we finally reach 100% of debt to GDP. Um, yeah, so yeah, you can deflate away your debt, um, but it's not a good policy. And I don't think it's deliberate. I don't think they're deliberately doing that. But good question, David. Thank you. Um, well, my dog's abandoned me. And back to your questions. Um, Ollie Beast one says, please show us the S&P 500 price to forward earnings graph on Pension Craft. Your wish, my command. Right, so let's share my screen. And then you'll be able to see it. Here we go. So this is the Pension Craft website. And we'll maximize that. So the tool we're talking about is the forward valuation. Just to show you how um, overpriced US stocks are right now. So this takes a while to wake up the web service. And so this is, let me zoom in so you can see this better. So this is the forward price to earnings multiple for the United States, uh, for the S&P 500. So what this does is it takes the price of the S&P 500, the index value, and it divides by the forecast earnings for the S&P over the 12 months ahead, which is currently $233. So the more expensive the US market is, the higher the multiple that you pay for those forecast earnings uh, over, the, over the next 12 months. So a kind of average, six, the 60 year average of that multiple is 24% below where the S&P closed yesterday. In other words, if we went to fair value, a fair multiple, which is 15 times forward earnings, we're currently at well above that. We're currently above 19 times forward earnings. We're currently at over 20 times forward earnings, which is very high. Even at the peak of the euphoria in 2022, just before stocks derated, we can see that it reached something um, comparable to where we are now. It's a little bit higher then than we are now. But this huge rally that we've seen this year, particularly for the NASDAQ and for those mega cap stocks, that's pushed valuations way up in the United States and made a lot of people uncomfortable. I think at this point, this is going to reduce future growth or the future profits that you'll make in the US stock market. And it's making other markets seem relatively more attractive. And um, one of the things I was thinking about talking about was um, what some of those markets might be. But um, that's a future video. So, yeah, US expensive. And this has been a re-rating rally, not a fundamentally driven rally. In other words, not because profits have been increasing. In fact, it's the opposite. We've had an earnings recession for the last two quarters. Um, it's because people have been paying more for less profit in the US equity market. Uh, overall, of course, for some of the mega caps, you do have really good, strong earnings growth. But again, even for those, you've got a huge uh, euphoria in the in the multiples. Uh, if you look at individual companies like NVIDIA, say, or, or Amazon, for example. So, yeah, there we go. So that's what you asked for. And how are we doing for... Super chats, no super chats, no more super chats, and uh, no more uh, member questions. Meta skyrocketing after hours, Ben Y says. Residential property expected to fall 31%. Yeah, plausible. Unlikely, I think, because there's still this kind of supply demand imbalance. 
and there's a huge lack of supply at the moment in the US, but presumably that'll increase with more house building. But with mortgages, mortgage servicing costs so high, you know, it's going to be really tough for many Americans um, uh, if they don't have the choice of staying where they are uh, with a low 30 year mortgage. But yeah, we could see a fairly significant US um, house price fall. Although we've still seen, we've already seen some falls, but what we're seeing now is it does seem to be kind of stabilizing the housing market. Um, is there a better way to manage inflation now and in the future? Uh, surely prevention is better than a cure. Well, the thing is, when you get these kind of shocks, these huge shocks, these exogenous shocks, things like a pandemic, there isn't a lot you can do. Um, I mean, for example, if it was a supply chain issue, then you could have made supply chains more robust. But of course, that costs money. And people just don't like to pay more unless they have to. So would you like to pay more for your products during the good times and then you'll be ready f with more robust supply chains for a, for a disruption in future which ultimately will happen or would you rather pay a cheap price for as long as you can and then just pay the consequences when there is a disruption and i think most people opt for the kind of <laughs> pay less now and and pay the price later uh, unfortunately but it is difficult, you know, to try and to try and um, to try and plan for these things and to try and avoid inflation spikes when they are caused by such a, such an extreme event as um, as as a, as a pandemic. Certainly, monetary policy is much better than it used to be. So before we had a Federal Reserve banking system and the current system with central banks with this two percent inflation target, inflation was much less stable. You look at the nineteenth century, and it was all over the place. Uh, it was largely driven by crop failures in those days, but it certainly was much more volatile. And it's been pretty restrained inflation over the last 20 years or so in the US and the UK um, since the Volcker period. Uh, but, but, but still, yeah, I think we will get these shocks in future. and There's, there's not a lot you can do to avoid them. Um, oh, there's a super chat uh, from... Well, I think it's someone who's Polish, so it's Loza Shidisov. Shidisov? Shidikov? I hope I pronounced that correctly. Um, so, very informative. Thank you. I have over 2K not vested NVIDIA employee stocks. Congratulations. Laura just bought some NVIDIA stocks and they're doing very well, apparently. Uh, Think you of selling CDFs. Um, to lock the price. Is it a good idea? Well, the valuation on NVIDIA is kind of crazy now. There's no way they can generate profits in line with their price currently. So there will come a reckoning. But when that reckoning will happen, nobody knows. If it was me, yeah, I'd probably de-risk. If it was my choice. Well, that's not advice, by the way. You know, I don't do that. But I am quite a nervous person, right? So I, <laughs> I'm quite cautious. So you know, I just bag it and just and just kind of pocket the uh, and pocket the uh, pocket the difference. Yeah, I, I don't think I'd, I'd kind of uh, be exposed to Nvidia at this point. Laura's only doing it because she felt it in her waters. So apparently, that's how she makes her judgments on on her stocks. You know, she feels it in her waters, and apparently, her waters were telling her. Nvidia was a good buy. In fact, I think she was just boring because she had consumer staples which were going nowhere. So that was just to liven her portfolio up. That's what she told me. <laughs> okay. Anyway, so I hope that uh, kind of helped. But of course, I don't advise. Um, you have to decide on your own there what to do. Um, so back to your questions. And how are we doing for time? How are we doing for time? 9.30. Yes, I think we'll probably draw to close soon. Oh, and there was a, a super chat, I guess, just to thank us from Eddie Ward. I appreciate it, Eddie. Thank you for that. Um, question from Paul and Charlie Hayes. Um, how can the NASDAQ go up when the Fed are tightening? 
euphoria. You know, people are going back. People have called it an echo bubble, which I really like as a phrase. This is John Authors, who writes for the for Bloomberg now, used to be for the FT. He described it as an echo bubble because people are remembering when interest rates were at zero. And so as soon as they see signs that the Fed's slowing down and that inflation's kind of slowing down, we've got disinflation, they're thinking, oh, we're going back to 2%, everything's going to be like it was. But of course it's not, is it? It's not going to go back to zero interest rates. I'd be surprised if it, if, if um, the policy rate goes much below 2% for, for a couple of years now. Um, but um, that's the euphoria that we see. So, you know, allegedly because of AI. Certainly if you look at the stocks which have rallied, you could make a case that it's about AI. But really it's about economic growth being okay, unemployment not rising a lot. So US growth is still pretty good. There's still pretty good demand for goods and services. And supply and demand of labor is out of balance. There's still a big demand for labor and not a lot of supply. So that's still a pro problem. Um, so Martin Boyle says, thanks Roman. I agree we should pay more for resilience, but human nature seems to be to go against that. Yeah, so people don't plan for this kind of thing. Um, OK, this is a nice point from Alex, who's one of our supporters on YouTube. Thank you, Alex W. He says, thanks for the information. How long will the balance sheet take to run off? And what kind of creaks in the system might it cause if it continues at the same rate? Right, so if we've got... So we can work it out, right? So if we've got... Um, it's kind of an exponential decay because if we've got the bonds kind of maturing, then you'll get an exponential decay in the size of the balance sheet. We can do it roughly, you know, just kind of napkin um, calculations. So if we've got a balance sheet of 9 trillion and we've got... 35 billion per month um, plus that's mortgage backed securities and then I think it was 60 billion for the treasuries if we divide one by the other uh, I didn't mean to do that if we divide one by the other then what are we going to get Yeah, I've just completely screwed. Oh. oh, Windows. If I was on Ubuntu, I could fix this, but I can't see. Pains. Show all pains. Here we go. Yeah, here we go. So, so that's about 95 months. Uh, so 95 months is about... Is about... Uh, eight years to completely normalize but of course a lot of that is going to happen sooner so probably about four years it'll halve in size um, and it really depends on the maturity profile of the treasuries the US tends to have lots of short-term debt and um, so a lot of that stuff's going to be maturing faster than I think that nine-year estimate would suggest so really depends on the average maturity if the average maturity is around seven years then you know then uh yeah probably about five seven years something like that for it to halve would be my guess um but it'll take a while that's for sure martin boyle has just bought shares in biltong rapid growth yes thanks to teddy and his biltong habit but also laura she eats a lot of biltong uh, so Meta reports 11% revenue growth, hence the rally. Yeah, so that is fundamentally driven in part at least. And how are Cathy Wood's ARK investments going? <laughs> They're certainly doing well. You know, if you compare it to the uh, low point after the crash in 2022, they're up about 40-50% as far as I can tell. Last time I looked. Um Eddie Ward says he's only just tuned in. He's going to have to rewind. OK. <laughs> um, where will rates settle at? That's another interesting question, Eddie. I think uh, if you look at the Fed's own forecast, what they're saying, if you look at the FOMC dot plots, let's just bring them up, actually, because then, then we can just look at their data. 
and I'll share with you. And it's actually in the slides. So if we look at the long run estimate, that's what we're interested in. And I'll share this, make that bigger. Yeah, so the long run estimate for um, the federal funds rate is 2.5%. So at the short end of the curve, 2.5. Long end of the curve, 20, 30 years, usually it's around 5%. That's the kind of average because that reflects GDP and inflation. And for a developed market like the US, that's where you'd expect it to add up to, usually around 5%, plus a bit of term premium for taking the duration risk. So 2.5% at the short end when things are normal, and then, if we can remember that, and then about 5% at the long end, and upward sloping, of course, unlike at the moment, which is inverted. Um, so that's where we're probably heading to. But it's going to take a while. And the Fed, according to the Fed, we're not going to get back to kind of normal Fed funds. Uh, even by 2025, they think it's going to be around 3.4%. That's what they thought in June. Um, that's their median forecast with a range of between um, 2.9 and 4.1. That was the range for 2025 as of June uh, for, for the FOMC summary of economic projections. So, you know, it's going to be high for a while at the short end. So this is another argument, I think, for, for, for making use of that and, you know, buying that short end of the curve with single bonds or with, with money market funds. You're being paid to take very little risk. So that's, that's still pretty attractive. So let's wrap it up there. Thank you for your uh, questions, unless we've got any more super chats. Um, yeah, I think that was it. So please do subscribe and like our channel, like this video, subscribe to our channel. And uh, please do think about our membership, pensioncraft.com, where you can talk about monetary policy or your investments or anything you like to do with investment or other, other things as well people talk about. Um, we have a chat application, we have lots of members only videos, we have those tools which you could see which have the um, allow you to plan your retirement but also things which give you macroeconomic data but um, valuation data for the US and elsewhere. So please do consider joining us and um, hopefully this has been useful and we will be covering the UK as well with the with the um, with the with the Bank of England's monetary policy meetings. And I think we've also got another meeting. We've also got a YouTube live, I think, next week. Laura will correct me on this afterwards, I'm sure. Um, but we do have these regularly. So thank you all for joining us. I hope it was useful and take care and good luck with your with your portfolio.